You know, I've been around for a while. Met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. See, you just might think that there's not much that can take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories, science and things that amaze and confound me. Every single day, incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night, some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Is the history of the world wrong? In a Mexican cave, a young girl finds a bizarre 900-year-old skeleton. Is it evidence aliens once walked our planet? This is the equivalent of landing on the moon. A Peruvian doctor discovers stone carvings that could rewrite the history of evolution. Did dinosaurs live alongside humans? This is one of archaeological's most baffling enigmas. And a 2,000-year-old wooden model reveals an incredible secret. Did the ancient Egyptians invent the airplane? This is going to throw the way we view ancient civilizations completely topsy-turvy. Yeah. It's a weird world, and I love it. They make me think, especially anything about history. Thousands of years of human development and achievement. They're all contained in the pages of these wonderful documents that not only teach generation after generation about where we came from, but where we might be going. Have you ever stopped to consider what it might mean for us if, if all we've learned and all we think we've learned about our past is wrong? It's unthinkable, isn't it? Well, guess what? There's real and bizarre events out there that are telling us we may need to rethink everything we know about everything. The unthinkable is here. Researcher Lloyd Pye is the guardian of what he contends is the most important artifact ever discovered. The story begins in the Mexican countryside over 80 years ago. It was originally discovered in about 1930 by a young girl about 100 miles southwest of Chihuahua. She was visiting relatives there. She went out exploring the area, found a mine tunnel, went in, and inside the tunnel found two skeletons. Examining the bones, the girl thinks one of the skulls looks very strange. It was a misformed or uh, misshapen skull. She believed it was a deformity. With no idea what she stumbled across, the girl removes the skull as a macabre souvenir. She holds onto it for 60 years. She brought it to her home in El Paso, kept it for her whole life. When she found out that she was dying in the early 90s, she asked some friends if they would take it for her. The skull ends up in the care of Melanie Young, a medical professional who immediately makes a shocking discovery. She had seen a lot of deformity, and she said right away, I don't think this is necessarily a deformed human skull. And that's how I got involved. Perplexed, Melanie approaches Lloyd. He's an expert in human skulls. But in his years of studying human development, he's never seen anything like it. When I looked into those eyes, it was like, whoa, this really is something unusual. It's so unusual. It, it's so bizarre. A moron can see. This is not really a human skull. It's something else, but what? But by the same token, I was like everybody else. My first reaction was, it has to be some kind of deformity. Because if it's not, then this is the equivalent of the shepherd that found the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, this is a big deal. And I, I didn't believe that that kind of thing would just fall into my lap. I took it to experts. 
in every field of, of human physiology. The eye guy, the brain guy, the ear guy, the skull shape guy. During the course of 99, I came to understand that physiologically, it was really nothing like a human. It is human-like, but it is definitely non-human. No other way to say it. But if it's not human, what was it? Lloyd broadens his search. I took it to experts in UFOs and aliens and have people who had been in it for years evaluate it. After close examination, the UFO experts reach a stunning conclusion. The skull is an alien that died on Earth and was buried on Earth 900 years ago. The consensus was it looks like the skull of a gray alien. The alien that we all know, the one with the heart-shaped face on a thin little neck and the weird eyes, we all know that look, a gray alien. Dear friends, we are gathered here today to pay our last tributes and respects to the memory of our departed and beloved alien child. Mm. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, would you, would, would you excuse me for a moment? Now, this story is definitely weird. Does the star child skull belong to an alien child who was visiting or even conceived on Earth but tragically died? If so, does this change the course of history? But even more importantly, what about the parents? Did anyone think of letting them know? Did they give their child a proper farewell? I doubt it. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Was a wonderful child who loved comic sports and practical jokes like destroying planets with his father's death ray, he'll be sadly missed. Would anyone like to say a few words? Is the star child skull the most important archaeological discovery ever made? Not everyone thinks so. Yale University neurology professor Stephen Novella has studied the star child skull and claims its appearance is nothing unusual. Going through medical school and training as a neurologist, I've seen uh, many examples of uh, similar kinds of deformities before. There are lots of genetic anomalies that produce abnormalities or deformities. Novella's research has led him to believe the star child skull belonged to a human suffering from a medical condition called hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a term that literally means water on the brain. And what happens is that the fluid that's normally inside and around the brain does not flow like it normally should. And that causes the, the water and the pressure to build up inside the brain and inside the skull. In young children where the bones of the skull have not yet fused, this can cause the skull to balloon out, sometimes even to incredible size. In an adult where all the, the bones of the skull have completely fused together, then the hydrocephalus would just cause increased pressure on the brain, uh, but not an expansion of the skull itself. So does this mean that we've yet to play host to intergalactic visitors? I have nothing against the notion that there are aliens in the universe. I think it would be really cool. I just don't think this skull is it. This is not the evidence of anything alien. So is this the end of the mystery? Did the star child skull belong to a human suffering from hydrocephalus? Trenton Holliday and John Verano are professors of anthropology at the University of Tulane. They have a different take. Originally, when I saw the skull, I suspected it might have suffered from hydrocephaly. However, I have since revised my opinion on that. I don't think it was a hydrocephalous individual. So if not an alien and not hydrocephalic, just who was the star child? The most unusual feature of this star child skull is just the shape of the skull. It's flattened in the back, it's bulged at the sides, and I can explain that very easily by cradle boarding. Cradle boarding was an early solution to a problem many of us face today, making kids portable. Cradle boarding was a very common practice in South America. It was originally done as a means of restraining the infants so that they could be brought out into the fields. It also was done for aesthetic reasons. But how could a simple baby carrying device create the bizarre shape of the star child skull? Here's an example of an actual cradle board from Peru. 
I've strapped on a doll just to give you an idea of the way an infant would be put on it. And then here you can see how the head is strapped down. The strap goes over the forehead and goes over the back of the skull, holds the child's head in place, allows it to move probably from side to side. And in fact, many of these are asymmetrical, which suggests that they were lying habitually to one side or another. But cradleboarding had a side effect. As the skull was compressed in one direction, it grew in the other to make room for the baby's rapidly developing brain. This is a, a child skull that was cradle boarded. It's bulging out on the two sides, and that's because there's pressure that was put on the, the back side of the skull. What you can see is the way the skull is flattened on the back, and it's kind of bulging up from the side, giving it this unusual shape that if you didn't know about cradle boarding, you might think, boy, that's a bizarre looking human skull. When a skull is cradle boarded, a baby's bones are so soft that they flatten. So if you feel this, it's very flat, as flat as the board that it was pressed to. The star child has its natural convolutions to it. So what that means is it was not flattened artificially, it grew this way. Its genes told it to grow. Now another interesting difference is that a, a normal human, the crown of the head is round all the way around here, rounded, rounded. If you look at the star child, you see clearly that there is a crease here down the middle, a crease. And that could only occur if the, the, the suture, this suture line right here, had been fused in, in a human, was fused early. And then you could have a shape like this where the brain would grow out and around and that wouldn't really spread out because the suture line would be prematurely fused. But we CAT scanned the star child and all of its sutures are open. There's no premature fusing. It's, it's very normal. And also, it's very symmetrical. If you look at the whole skull, it's extraordinarily symmetrical. For as strange as it looks, it's more symmetrical than the human skull. It's more symmetrical than my skull or, or any average person's skull. In fact, one of the hallmarks of beauty, everyone agrees, is that the most symmetrical faces are the most beautiful in people tend to be. So that too is very different. Now another aspect of, of extreme difference between the star child and a human is the thickness of the bone. And we can see that very closely here. You see the difference. It's half or less, the star child's bone is half or less as thick. It weighs half as much. It's very much lighter in the hand than is a human skull. Having dismissed the opinion of traditional science, Lloyd undertook his own research. His findings are astonishing. What makes the star child skull different is that there are 25 major physical differences between it and human skulls. There's not one part of it that's exactly like a human. It is completely different, and what that indicates is that its genes are radically different but does this mean the star child skull could only be of extraterrestrial origin? In 2003, DNA technology allowed Pi to put his theory to the test. We got the first test by a laboratory that was capable of doing ancient DNA. And the answer that they got was that the mother was human and the father was not. Clearly, something's wrong with the father. Father's not human. Is the star child skull evidence that aliens bred with humans. Native American legends tell stories strikingly similar to Pi's theory. There would be beings from the stars would come down from the skies, pick a woman in a village, and they would make her pregnant. So the star child fit right into that. But as technology advances, so does the story of the star child skull. In early 2011, a new DNA test led Lloyd to an even more astonishing claim. The conclusion that we've come to now after several DNA tests and an extensive analysis of those results is that the star child had an alien father and an alien mother. And when I say alien, I mean non-human. The difference is so stark, the difference is so wide, there is no way that we can call this a human. Is this the first physical evidence that aliens exist? Lloyd has no doubt. It's going to change human history to have to accept that at least once, 900 years ago, an alien being walked the earth, lived here, 
died here and was buried here. This is the equivalent of landing on the moon. What is the star child skull? For now it remains an enigma. Did it belong to a deformed child or an ancient adult with a disease of the brain? Is it conclusive evidence that we are not alone? Weird. Or what? You know, I've always had a, a fascination with the relics the ancient past. And I'm not just talking about the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Leonard Nimoy. No, 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 no. When it comes to our far distant history, there's nothing quite as spectacular, mysterious, and even frightening as dinosaurs. Surely the king of all creatures, real life monsters that dominated the planet until something wiped them out long before man even evolved. What a pity that we only find them now in museums or as cute toys. Can you imagine what it would be like to see one in the flesh? Well, maybe we already have. And maybe we still can. Adventurer Dennis Swift travels the world in search of ancient artifacts, but nothing he's found compares to a discovery made in Ica, Peru, by a man named Javier Cabrera. Dr. Cabrera made the greatest discovery in the history of mankind. The implications are staggering. It began innocently enough at a birthday party in 1966. It was Dr. Cabrera's 42nd birthday. One of the doctor's oldest friends brings him a special gift. Dr. Cabrera was given a stone. It was found in some official uh, archaeological excavations. The stone was carved by an ancient Peruvian tribe. His friend thinks it's a trinket, but the doctor makes a discovery that sets his heart racing. Etched into the stone is an image that defies explanation. He recognized it to be a species of fish that went extinct 150 million years ago. Now, how do you explain that? Seeking answers, the doctor employs local workmen to find more stones. Dr. Cabrera began to find more in these stones, and people brought them to him. The more he delved into it, the more it consumed his life. As more and more stones arrive, Dr. Cabrera realizes they feature other images that just shouldn't have been there. Some of the stones seem to be depicting impossible scenes, things that would cause the textbooks to be rewritten. What had the doctor found? It was something that would shock the world. He risked his reputation. He said, if you look closely at this, you'll see a dinosaur carved there with two people. It's an astonishing moment. But how could it be? Dinosaur fossils weren't identified until 1824. How could an ancient people have known about them a thousand years ago? Finding artifacts and information that showed that these people had knowledge of dinosaurs that predated our knowledge was truly amazing. But could it be proved? After comparing the etchings on over 400 stones to real fossils, he discovered the depictions were accurate. The Peruvian artists must have known what dinosaurs looked like. Now, not only is that astonishing, it began to say to him they saw living, breathing dinosaurs. This is one of archaeological's most baffling enigmas. Did the dinosaurs live millions of years longer than we thought they did? I've studied the Ica stones for well over 20 years. I believe they are very substantial, strong evidence that dinosaurs and man live together. Current scientific belief is that the dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid 66 million years ago. 59 million years before early man even existed. Swift, however, believes there's evidence to the contrary. 
in the cultures around the world, they talk about encountering these animals of giant size, and they fit the description of what we would call a dinosaur. Of course, dinosaur did not, was not coined until 1841 by Sir Ed, Edward Owen. It's a compound Greek word that means terrible lizard or frightfully fearful lizard. If you read the science books of the 1300s, 1400s, and 1500s, when they talk about dragons, they resemble very much what we would describe as a dinosaur. Could some dinosaurs have survived extinction? Did they walk among ancient Peruvians? For Swift, the artifact's uncannily accurate proportions don't lie. Here's a Strirocosaurus on the stone. Does it have dermal spines? Yeah. Does the tail sticking out when it's walking? Yes. Does it have three toes? Yes. All right, so it's a dinosaur. But if Swift is right, there's an even bigger question. If dinosaurs walked the Earth with humans only a relatively short time ago, then what happened to them? And where are they? I believe that they existed from a few thousand years ago to maybe 500 years ago, and there's a possibility that there could be a handful left. There was a Frenchman in 1967, I believe, even took photographs of a, of a footprint. It's three-toed, it's huge, and it has a claw on the back. Only a dinosaur had that kind of a footprint. So, yeah, dinosaurs could be out there. Oh, boy, this is incredible. I mean, that guy thinks that dinosaurs are still roaming the Earth. Wow, <laughs> let's think of, about what that means. There's not a lot of room left on the planet, so they're going to have to share our neighborhoods, right? Maybe, maybe we could have one as a pet. Can you imagine keeping one in your backyard? I think not. Has somebody got a pooper scooper? Did man and dinosaur coexist? Should we rip up our history books? Ancient Peruvian stone carvings pose a shocking question. Did our ancient ancestors walk alongside dinosaurs? Archaeologist Ken Fetter doesn't think so. I think that people actually watch the Flintstones and think it's reality programming. It's not. It's a cartoon, folks. Fred did not have a pet dinosaur. That really didn't happen. But how can Fetter be sure humans never saw dinosaurs? He points to the tens of thousands of fossils collected worldwide, which confirm they died out 66 million years ago. We have a whole lot of evidence that dinosaurs died off long before there were people. And the fact that we have a bunch of stones with carvings and people riding around on dinosaurs is not strong evidence at all. But if ancient Peruvians didn't see dinosaurs, how do we explain the Ica stones? They're fakes. They're hoaxes. The story of the Ica stones from start to finish mirrors the stories of lots of other archaeological hoaxes. They start small, but once it becomes clear that there's a guy willing to buy some stones, suddenly we have thousands of these things, and the actual stones themselves become more and more elaborate. Rather than finding them in caves, could the Peruvian peasants simply have made the stones themselves? There's only one way to find out. Art student Justine McGraw has been asked to test Fetter's theory that the stones are merely fakes. She's going to attempt to replicate the stones using basic tools. So I begin by just copying out the image. It's a very simple line drawing. The drawing complete, Justine begins carving. She uses a power tool for speed, though the etching could easily be done by hand. Although the pattern is complete, the stone doesn't have an ancient look. Justine has an inexpensive solution. I'm going to cover the stone in a mixture of manure and olive oil. It's a rather down-to-earth solution. Her method of baking the stones is equally low-tech. But could some manure, olive oil, and a barbecue really recreate the mysterious Ica stones? After just three hours of baking, this is what my Ica stone looks like. For Fetter, the results of this experiment are decisive. We have two possible explanations in science, one that requires overturning everything we know, and one that simply requires that people are trying to make a buck by hoaxing. So it's a lot easier for me to accept the possibility that people are making fakes than to completely rewrite everything we know about again, geology, biology, 
and so on. Is this the end of the mystery? Are the Ecostones just fakes? Author Andy Lloyd is not so sure. They weren't just created in someone's shed in the back garden 20 years ago. Some scientific work that's been done on them appears to indicate that there is a degree of oxidation over the engravings, which would indicate that they're of some antiquity. So if the stones really are ancient, that proves that the images they depict must have happened, right? Well, not necessarily. I don't think that's very, very likely that man and dinosaur could have shared the earth at any time. However, that's not to say that there isn't something rather wonderful about the Icarus stones in this regard. And one of the ideas that I've put forward is that the makers of the Icarus stones, the artists from ancient Peru who created them, may have received knowledge about dinosaurs from ancient civilizations whose own understanding of the dinosaurs was as good as ours. Civilizations stretching back to ancient Greece unearthed dinosaur remains. They thought they were the bones of giants. But what if some ancient civilization did know what they were? Who could have done such a thing? Atlantis is an excellent candidate because the discussions and descriptions of Atlantis show that it was a very technologically advanced civilization for its time. The lost city of Atlantis an advanced ancient civilization that is said to have flourished around the time of the Ice Age before falling into the ocean. Could Atlanteans have discovered dinosaurs? We can speculate that the Atlanteans had a, a very good understanding of um, natural history because their ability with science and technology was evidently quite far advanced. They would have probably dug up dinosaur bones during their mining expeditions and pieced together a dinosaur in the same way that we did. You know, I like to think of myself as a bit of an adventurer, sort of an Indiana Jones, if you like. Right. You see, I've been all over the world and collected some amazing relics. Wrong relic. Of course, some are more amazing than others. And some make you wonder what they might say if they could talk. Can you imagine finding something that could truly change the world? Well, here it is. Saqqara, Egypt, in one of the country's oldest burial grounds, French archaeologists begin to unearth the burial tomb of the 3rd century BC official, Paddy Iman. Among the artifacts recovered is what looks to be a model of a bird. It's cataloged and stored at the Cairo Museum for over 70 years. But no one could predict the shockwaves Special Register 6347 would soon make. The late Egyptologist Dr. Khalil Messia realized the model was very unusual. It leads him to a breathtaking conclusion. Dr. Messia had found evidence of what appears to be a glider or an airplane, something that the ancient Egyptians supposedly didn't have. Author David Childress thinks that Dr. Messia has much to teach historians and the world. To me, the research of Dr. Khalil Messia is very important because here we have a mainstream Egyptologist finding an artifact uh, that we know is authentic, coming from uh, over 2,000 years ago, a model, uh, a very miniature model of an airplane much like the early airplanes that were built uh, in America and around the world at the turn of the century. Could the artifact be a model of an ancient flying machine? It's a stunning revelation. Our histories tell us the first powered human flight was in 1903. If Dr. Messiah is correct, the ancient Egyptians may have beaten the Wright brothers by over 2,000 years. 
Although met with initial skepticism, tests by leading aeronautical engineers prove that the model, now known as the Sakara Bird, was designed for flight. Did the ancient Egyptians experiment with flight? Is the artifact the model of a full-size glider or plane? It's very important that we find artifacts like the Saqqara bird and, and other strange artifacts from these ancient cultures, because it really helps us place their legends and myths in contexts such as flight. Is the Saqqara bird proof that the ancient Egyptians had technology 2,000 years ahead of its time? And if they did, how did they get it? This is going to throw Egyptology and the way we view ancient civilizations completely topsy-turvy. A man discovers a model wooden bird in a Cairo museum. Is the Saqqara bird proof the Egyptians took to the skies 2,000 years ago? Katya Gomes is an Egyptologist. She has her doubts. When I first heard that uh, the Saqqara bird was being used to support such claims of early aviation, I was completely uh, taken aback. Certainly, they were fascinated with the skies. They believed that their dead ascended to the sky to become celestial gods after death. Uh, their chief deities were seen to be traveling through the sky, the sun god being the most important there, but there is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the Egyptians had an interest in aviation. But if the Saqqara bird was not the model of a glider, what was it? The symbol of a bird is extremely important uh, within the Egyptian religious and political system. We find them used in the hieroglyphic writing system. We find them as images protecting the king. One bird in particular, the falcon, had a role which explains why it would be placed in a tomb. The deceased Egyptian wishes to ascend to the sky and uh, sometimes says he does so uh, on falcon's wings. In particular, the falcon with the outstretched wings you will find at the back of the king's head, indicating that uh, he is afforded the protection of the gods and he is in fact Horus on earth. Um, we find uh, amuletic uh, representations of falcons as protective devices in funerary contexts, that means in Egyptian tombs, decorating the coffins of the dead, uh, being placed as little uh, protective objects, amulets, on the actual mummies, or painted on the coffins, painted on the uh, sides of the, uh, sorry, on the walls of the tombs, uh, and so forth. There's one problem, though. The cigar bird looks nothing like the other Egyptian falcons. So what can explain its flat tail and plane-like wing? It is not unheard of that toys were given to deceased children and they would be put into their tombs so they would be accessible for their afterlife and for their eternal pleasure. Could the mysterious artifact be nothing more than a simple child's toy? Are the smooth body and flat tail the result of amateur craftsmanship and not deliberate design? Even though there are a few idiosyncrasies in its representation, the Saqqara bird is most likely an image of a falcon. There is no evidence that the Egyptians experimented with aviation technology. The claim is ludicrous, to say the least, so it is not inconceivable that the Saqqara bird was a toy uh, that was given to a child or even to an adult who wanted to take his favorite uh, childhood toy with him uh, into the afterlife. Are we reading too much into an ancient toy? Not everyone thinks so. Artifacts like the Scar Bird are important because science likes to think it's got everything explained. We can explain uh, how the Egyptians built the pyramids and all of their ancient technology. But items like the Saqqara Bird throw a monkey wrench into some of these old theories because suddenly, it's possible that the ancient Egyptians and other civilizations could do much like we did and have flight, have electricity, have machines. When we look at ancient civilizations like the ancient Egyptians, we see that they've made so many magnificent buildings and their sciences were very exact. Uh, they were good engineers. Uh, they studied uh, nature tremendously. So the Saqqara bird seems to indicate that, yes, 
The ancient Egyptians knew about flight and had it. But how can children be so sure that what looks like a bird is really a model airplane? It's clearly an aerodynamic design and not just some simple toy. The wings are at what is known as the dihedral angle. It's a special angle that the wings of a glider have to be at in order to achieve lift. And the Scarbird has that. So the wings are airworthy. But what about the tail? Dr. Messia had also found evidence that the very top part of the tail rudder had been broken off. And he theorized that it had, in fact, had also another vertical tail, much like a modern jet would have. But if the cigar bird was a model of an ancient glider, there's one big problem. Where in Egypt's flat desert could you glide from? If it was a glider, it could have been launched easily from the top of a pyramid, perhaps, much like hang gliders themselves launch today off of uh, cliffs and mountains. Or even the Egyptians could have developed uh, a relatively primitive uh, catapult-type launching system that would have given the, this glider the power to get in the air and then fly over areas of Egypt. I believe that the ancient Egyptians and other civilizations had powered flight, as well as gliders and airships and balloons, and even they had electricity and lights. Even they must have had power tools in some of their cases to build some of the buildings they had. Were the crowning achievements of Egyptian civilization used as a launch pad by an ancient pair of Wright brothers? If scientists are right that this is a model of a functioning glider, this is going to throw Egyptology and the way we view ancient civilizations completely topsy-turvy. OK, this is blowing my mind. Are they honestly trying to tell me that this 2,000-year-old ugly duckling is evidence of an ancient mastery of the laws of aerodynamics, that it could fly? Well, there's only one way to find out. Anybody got any clue? A simple bird replica or evidence of early flight. What is the Sakara bird? Martin Gregory designs gliders. He thinks he knows the answer. When I first heard the Sakara bird was the model for a full-size airplane, I was um, skeptical to say the least. I knew for a start that the ancient Egyptians didn't have anything that could be used as an engine to power an aeroplane. And that gives you the clue, because Egypt's pretty flat, and you're going to need some way of getting the aeroplane into the air. And you also, if you're going to use it for carrying cargo, you're going to need something to power it so it can travel a useful distance. I decided the only way I could find out if the Sakura bird could have been a flying model was to build one myself. Using the exact dimensions of the ancient artifact, Gregory constructs an identical replica. He'll launch it with a device used to test scale glider models. I'm just about to launch the Sakura bird in its original form as it came out of the pyramid with no tail plane. That flight did what I expected it to do. Its lack of aerodynamics kicked in, and it tumbled and fell to the ground. The test is conclusive. A model of that size needs a stabilizing tail. Dr. Messia believed that the Sakara bird originally had a tail, which had snapped off with age. Could a tail make a difference? Next, we're going to launch the Sakara bird again but this time fitted with a tailplane. This will stabilize it and let us see how good or poor a glider it is. 2,000 years of history hang on this one test.
It travels further, but not much. The end results are the same. The wing has rounded edges, and that just doesn't generate very much lift at all. And in terms of stability, all modern airplanes have the wing bent up at the tips for stability instead of swooping down like this one does. So does the experiment prove that the Sakara bird was really a child's toy? Following his experiment, Gregory has a theory of his own. I think there's a possibility that it's a wind vane. I discounted the child's toy theory on the grounds that all real birds have a flat horizontal tail rather than a vertical fin, and most children will be able to recognize the, dis dis the difference and not be fooled by the presence of the fin. To find out whether it was, could have been a wind vane, um, I put a pivot on, on the belly of it, and um, as you can see, I think it's a far better weather vane than it is a flying model. So, is the answer to a 2,000-year-old mystery really blowing in the wind? Was the Sakara bird simply an ancient plaything, or could it be evidence of mankind's first attempt at flight? We may never know. Weird or what? So there we have it. Three ancient artifacts that bring into question everything we understand about history. A bizarrely shaped skull is found in the Mexican cave. Is it proof that aliens once visited Earth? Scenes depicted on ancient stone carvings question our natural history. Did man and dinosaur share our planet? And a 2,000-year-old wooden model suggests the impossible. Did an ancient civilization fly? You decide. Join me again next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what?